in about 1900, the very early 1900s, this guy right here named Wilhelm Wilhelm von Austin was touring around with this horse right over here named Hans, and he called him Clever Hans. This is a picture of one of their little shows. And the claim was that this horse over here was so smart that he was able to teach it basic mathematics. So he, uh, he taught him to add and divide and even simple square roots. He could say, what's the square root of 4? Or, or what's 1 plus 1? And for either of those questions, the, the horse would tap its foot one, two times. And then everyone would be astonished. They'd say, oh, wow, that horse can add or can square root or whatever it is that he was doing. And it seemed pretty reasonable. How else would the horse be able to, you know, it was fairly accurate. It was above 80%, I believe, 86% of the time he would uh, get the right answer. And uh, moving a little ahead, he taught the horse how to spell by saying that 1 is equal to A and 2 is equal to B, two, two taps of the foot. And so he could say, you know, spell your name, and then the horse would spell out Hans. Um, and so this was all very impressive. You can see this crowd, and he made... Uh, well, actually, I don't think he charged admission. Um, if, if I remember from my research, he didn't even charge anyone to watch. He just toured around because he enjoyed doing it. So I don't want you to think he's a scam artist when we move on to the next part. Uh, so it was decided among people that this should be studied scientifically and see if this horse is actually as smart as he says it is. Because, uh, you know, there would be some implications. If horses were as smart as people, maybe we should treat them a little bit nicer I don't think we're that mean to horses, but we kind of, you could say, enslave them if we, um, if we want to be honest about it. If they're, if they are equivalent to humans in their minds, then we, then we <laughs> should we give them human rights? Um, it was a, it was a pretty important question. So this, uh, this task was passed on to Carl Stump, Stump or. Again, this PF sound, I just don't know how to say that. But Carl Stump went out and found a team of experts from every different field. He, he assembled the uh, scientific squad here to test it in all different ways. And the, they, they passed this investigation on to a man named, well, first name first, Oscar... Oscar Pfungst, or Funkst. Funkst. And the psychologist was the one who started to say, well, what if, what if we did it where the horse wasn't able to see Wilhelm von Osten? If we hid him from view, would the horse still be able to tap out the correct answer. And he had a bunch of other stipulations going on, one of which, which I think is really interesting that he even thought of this, is what if the experimenter, if the experimenter or the questioner, you could say, the person asking the question to the horse, um, didn't know the answer, did not know the answer ahead of time. And, you know, obviously if you're just asking 2 plus 2, it's hard to even not know the answer, but if it was something a little more complicated, and if the experimenter just opened up a piece of paper and read it, and then you know thought about it afterward, is is what they would do. So, uh, well, one of the other things he did was separate the crowd because um, they they're technically they're a factor in this experiment. They have to, if you want to be scientific about it you would have to remove as many other variables as you can. Maybe the horse was looking at the crowd for uh, for when to stop. Or, or maybe he was looking at Wilhelm von Austin for cues. You know, he would wink when it was time to stop tapping his hoof or something like that. 
And through a whole bunch of experiments with different people asking the questions, whether there was a crowd, whether there wasn't, whether the questioner knew the answer, they figured out that there was little subliminal cues, little um, tiny, tiny little behaviors that the people would do, that the questioner would do, that would cue the horse to begin tapping his hoof and to stop tapping his hoof. Like, they would lean forward a little bit um, in an anxious way. They would kind of tense up or, uh, you know, purse their lips, just some little, is he going to stop? They would be thinking in their head, like, uh, please stop so that you get the right answer. And then when the horse does the final tap, the, the correct number of hoof taps, they would relax. They'd say, oh, okay, he got it right. And, and the horse picked up on that, and that was why he got it right. It was this sort of feedback loop between the person who knew the answer and the horse who was just blindly uh, ju just following a behavior. You know, he, he just, oh, they want me to tap my foot a lot, and then when they relax, I'll stop tapping my foot, and they'll give me some hay or whatever else horses eat. So, um, so the fallout from this was that Wil Wilhelm von Austin was a little bit discredited, but he went on touring anyway, because people still like the spectacle, even if they know it's not uh, all that much of a breakthrough. And I really don't think that he was trying to be a scam artist or anything like that, because like I said, he didn't charge admission, he wasn't making a huge profit off of this. And also, he was he was a school teacher by profession, he was also... Um, into another, a couple other questionable sciences like uh, phrenology, which has now been discredited. It's thinking that you can tell tell things about people's personality by looking at the bumps on their head. So he was a little bit not the most scientific guy, but I think he had um, he had some good ambitions here. He was trying to uh, teach teach other animals to be as smart as humans, and uh, that, that's a that it's a good cause to try at. I, I think we found out that that's not true for most animals. We have a few possibilities in dolphins. But back on topic, the reason that this is important to psychology and to science in general is because we now can use the name Clever Hans to talk about experimenter expectancy bias. Experimenter... Hopefully you can kind of guess what this means. Expectancy expectancy bias. Bias is kind of a difficult word. But this is if the experimenter, the person doing the experiment, expects something to happen, they, they may accidentally cause it to happen in an unscientific way, like by their body language or by not removing the crowd from the scenario. Things like that. So it, it taught everyone, and psychology in general, um, a lesson about making sure to be very, very rigorous with our experiments and always controlling for the variables, and particularly um, things like learning and behavior w where you have, you have humans involved and you have other animals involved. There's lots of <laughs> There's lots of little communications that we might accidentally have, which is why now if we're going to experiment on pigeons or something, we always put them kind of in a box, and we don't really uh, we don't really mess with them. We don't touch them. We don't let them see us too much. If we experiment with rats, we just let them run the maze, and we don't really you know we try not to show them where to go or anything like that. So lesson learned: always make sure you're controlling your variables.